This is the dark and intriguing story of a woman named Anu Singh, a killer whose actions in the nation's capital continue to defy any rational explanation. You could not have written a more bizarre story. But was this strange tale a tragic crime of passion or something more sinister? You don't see murder very often occurring among the more privileged young people of the world. The scene that greeted the first responders offered little in the way of explanation. She grabbed hold of my forearm and said, he had a lot last night. But the terrible consequences of an unthinkable act were clear for all to see. He took two and a half days to die. He was tortured. The killing of Joe Chinque by his girlfriend Anu Singh was a crime that shook Australia. In October 1997, Anu Singh was a young law student at the Australian National University. But her life was about to unravel. She would go from an intelligent, aspiring lawyer to a defendant on trial for an unusual and calculated murder. sit there every day watching a young woman wondering how it was that that young woman who's just a few years younger than me was sitting there accused of of murder every day something new coming out that just left you shaking your head you couldn't actually believe what you were hearing because it just made the hairs on the back of your neck stand up the journey that led to the court that day started in early 1995 when Anu Singh began a relationship with Joe Chinque. They met in Newcastle at a night out. Joe had met her during the time she was doing her law degree. They conducted a long distance relationship for some time and then they made the decision that Joe would move to Canberra. Joe Chinque was a young man from Newcastle, New South Wales. His parents, Maria and Nino, had moved from Italy and had worked hard to build a life in Australia. Growing up, Joe was a keen sportsman and successful at school. He was very vivacious. He was full of life. He was a real extrovert. He was someone who, who uh, people were drawn to because he was just such a great guy. The family was hard to It's probably what I've been He graduated from university with a degree in civil engineering and soon after got a job at a firm in his hometown. He was always happy, always busy, he couldn't stay still. He just he had to do two, three things at a time. I'm not saying this because he's not here, but he had a lot, a lot of friends, a lot of friends. It wasn't the time that he start fighting with people like that. You know, it wasn't like that. Actually, if anything, he tried to, to calm people down. He never had a bad word to say about anyone, and I think that's what really magnetised him in terms of people just being drawn to him because he was essentially a good person. Um, he, he wasn't someone who, you know, who sought confrontation. Um, he was always very social. He could always have a conversation with just about anyone, and I think that's why so many people just thought so much of him. By 1996, Joe and Arnu's relationship had grown into something more serious, and to their friends, the couple appeared perfectly happy together. The impression I had with Joe and Anu and their relationship was, in the early stages, Joe was very taken by her. 
Initially, I think it was it was very physical, the attraction. Um, Anu clearly is not a silly girl. Um, she was studying law. I think that side of it and, and that academic, you know, intelligence, I think, also attracted Joe. So you combine those two things, and I think he, he was very taken with her. She was very dominant. She was very confident. And, that, and that's something that, that I think drew Joe to her like a moth to the flame. Anu Singh and, and Joe Chinque had been in what, what seemed to everybody to be a really loving uh, relationship. Well, certainly that, that Joe Chinque was in love with, with Anu Singh. However, as time wore on, friends and family began to notice that the relationship was perhaps not all it seemed to be. The first time I met Anu was at a dinner. The impression I had of her was she was a strange girl conversations that uh, we had during the dinner were about uh, the afterlife. Do you believe there's an afterlife? Uh, what, what exists after this world, which is all well and good, but she also spoke about things such as her previous relationship and how intense it was with her previous partner to Joe. She said they were so close, um, it was almost incestuous. I didn't know how to react to that. It certainly seemed odd to me, and it was clearly odd to Joe as well, but he said nothing, um, but it was clear that he was uncomfortable. She just struck me as someone who was looking for a reaction, someone who liked to shock and make an impression. He really did seem dimmed by her. She was always in the foreground, um, leading the conversation, leading very strange discussions at times, um, and Joe was always in the background. And this was not the Joe that I knew that I grew up with. When uh, Joe met, I called the devil because she's worse than a devil. Uh, he wasn't himself anymore. Uh, she demanded too much of him. When I was talking with my son, she was talking somewhere else. Soon she saw my son Joe was talking to me, she came and grabbed Joe from his back and started to talk and kiss him, this and that. But not only once, maybe four, five, six times. We had a lot of argument on the phone because every night Joe came back from work, I made sure that the food was on the table to eat. We sit on the table eating and talking. As she used to call 10 minutes after we eat, and he stopped eating and talked to him for one hour on the phone, every night. Then I started to get very upset about that. Uh, quite a few times, I went to the phone and I said, look, we eat at six o'clock in this house. Can you please ring at seven? Let him eat, and then you can talk all night. Joe changed very quickly when he started dating her just due to her dominant personality. He either had to submit or he would never have survived three weeks with her. And that's what he did. I, I believe he changed in order to be with her because he really wanted to be with her. With Arnu studying in Canberra and Joe living over 400 kilometres away in Newcastle, the relationship was becoming strained. After months of pressure, Joe finally relented and moved to Canberra to begin a new life with his girlfriend. We didn't want him to go there. We were so upset. We didn't want Joe to go down there. I was very angry with him. I said, why well, you want to live? Uh, you know, you got your family, you got your friends, your job here. If Joe Chinque hoped the move to the capital would appease Anu and mend their frail relationship, he was wrong. Anu's personality was becoming more and more difficult for him to deal with. Anu Singh came across as a, as a young woman who, who craved that attention from Joe and that she was creating a drama in her own life that she could be the central character of. And Joe was feeding her need for attention. He was feeding her with compliments. He was feeding her with reassurance that as time went on, she needed more. She had to up the stakes in the drama because was Joe getting to a point where he wasn't buying into her drama anymore? Was he getting fed up with having to constantly 
be there to make sure she knew she was beautiful and how many times can you say that to somebody before you get fed up with it and you get tired of it you want someone to get help but they they won't not long after moving to Canberra it seems that Joe was beginning to question his relationship with Anu he was growing tired of the emotional roller coaster that was their life together and he was making plans for a future without her I caught up with him probably two or three times in Canberra and the last time I caught up with him he had just bought himself a new car. He had a real spark in his eye over the car but I, I also got a sense that, that maybe there was a new chapter opening up for him that he was starting to feel more positive about things. He had made a decision that within himself that it's time for me to go. Buying the car was a part of that and it was an expression of that and Anu knew it, that's what I believe. And when that paradigm shift came and she understood it was coming, that's when she decided to do what she did. Less than three months later, Cho Chinque would be dead. In 1997, Jo Chinque and Anu Singh were living together in a house on Antil Street in the suburbs of Canberra. What started as a fiery and passionate relationship had turned sour, largely as a result of Anu's increasingly odd behaviour as she developed a series of bizarre obsessions with her health. She was a very accomplished law student. Uh, she'd been a, an excellent student in high school and yet had laboured under a burden of mental health problems for years. Anu Singh has a history of being an attention-grabbing, attention-seeking girl at her high school, um, somebody who was more intent than others around her to attract attention in this way. Um, she was focused on her physical appearance. She has a history of struggling when she left the environment of her hometown and went to university in Canberra. She had problems with eating disorder. Uh, she then developed preoccupations with her health. Uh, she began to believe uh, that she had terrible diseases, her insides were rotting. At one point she was convinced she had AIDS. So she develops this uh, sense of, of dying and falling apart, uh, which is part of a depressive illness. She believed that she had a debilitating disease and that Joe, because he had suggested that she take Ipecac, which was a, uh, a drug that induces vomiting, that she believed that Joe had caused issues with her health. Ipecac is a drug that helps you shed weight. At the time, Anu claimed that Joe had suggested to her that she take Epicac because she was constantly complaining about her weight and that she was overweight. For me, this is completely and utterly incongruent with Joe. Number one, because he never took drugs, and number two, I'm sure he didn't even know what it was. Whether she just perceived she had illnesses or whether she was deliberately faking these illnesses, I, I guess that only she can know that. But Anu Singh's come to a point where she felt that her life wasn't worth living, that she was going to end her life and she was going to take him with her for, for his part in her deteriorating health. Whatever the reason, Anu Singh began planning the suicide pact, with her and Joe apparently ending their lives together. The first time that Joe's parents had a sense that something was terribly wrong was when Joe failed to make his regular Sunday phone call home. I had the tea ready and we wait for him to ring. And he didn't ring. So around five o'clock, something like that, I rang him. I rang him and a strange voice answered the phone. I said, did I bring the wrong number? Who am I speaking to? And he said, um, sergeant or some police person. I said, what the police do in my son's place? He said, just a minute, please. At the same time, the police knock on our door. The police told me, you know, can you sit down, please? I said, what's going on here? 
And he says, is that bet your son? The son is said, I said that. Starts screaming, please. Don't say anymore. She killed him, did she? She killed him. Straight away I knew. Straight away I knew she did kill him. I started screaming, please don't tell me it's not true. It can't be true. That's when I knew it. It was a nightmare. It hasn't stopped. My godmother had rung my parents' place on that Sunday afternoon, which was the 26th of October, 1997. She was a little cryptic. She said something had happened in Canberra um, to Joe, and she asked me if I could meet her there the next morning. The first task for Joe's family and friends was to identify his body in the morgue. They pulled back the screen, and Maria was standing next to me, and Joe was on a stainless steel bed of some sort, with just a slight uh, purple vein running down his, the side of his face that was never there before, quite pale, hair, hair pulled back, um, bare-chested, and uh, was, was dead. Maria collapsed into my arms. I had to, I had to hold her up. She she literally collapsed the moment she saw him. Um, we were there for I don't know 10, 15 minutes. It seemed like an eternity, but it was probably 10 or 15 minutes, and she was grief stricken, obviously. It looked like the it was sleep. How can you? See your child, you give birth to, you feed him, you look after him, you bring up a man. I had to put him in the hole there, and she's still alive. We then went back to the headquarters of the Federal Police where they started to explain what they believe um, had occurred. Um, they had indicated um, that in a short period of time they had ascertained that Joe had not tried to commit suicide, um, that there had been some sort of foul play with Anu. What Joe's family and friends were still to discover was that this was not a crime of passion. The suicide pact that Anu had been plotting had resulted in only Joe's death. And the evidence was about to reveal that it was a death that had been planned months earlier. She's gone to the, to the National Library, researched books on how to commit suicide. She had lessons in how to inject somebody with drugs. She had gone through friends to find drug contacts. Perhaps the most chilling discovery the police made was that after months of preparation, Anu Singh had invited an audience. It slowly became apparent that the death of Joe Chinkwe was the culmination of a carefully staged drama on Antil Street, and it was Anu Singh playing the lead role. You could not have written a more bizarre story. Who would ever imagine that it's a real life story to say someone held a number of dinner parties to farewell herself and to lead into the murder of a young man. No one could write that. If you wrote it, it wouldn't be believed. On the night of the 20th of October, 1997, Arnu Singh, a bright young law student living in Canberra, arranged a dinner party at the home she shared with her boyfriend, Joe Chinque. The aim of the party was as twisted as it was horrific. There was a general understanding among the party guests that they were going along to witness the lead up to a crime and that this was going to be the night that Anu Singh was going to take her own life and take Joe Chinque's life in a suicide pact. I believe there was some discussion about the reason they were there amongst some of them, uh, but Joe was never aware of the reason for the party. He was simply attending because he lived at the house and Anu was his girlfriend. So as far as I can ascertain, he was not aware of 
the, the motive behind the party actually taking place. Anu Singh, by this point, clearly had a, a reputation among her friends as, as creating drama. Uh, so whether they've come along to the party simply believing that it was all hype and talk and that no such thing was ever going to happen, who knows what was going through their mind. So many people, many of whom were in fact intelligent uh, students at one of the preeminent law schools uh, in Australia, had gone along with her, who uh, knew that she was at the very least planning perhaps suicide and seemed blasé about that. They seemed, uh, many of them, quite content to see Anu uh, commit suicide and weren't prepared to do very much to stop her, even to talk her out of it. I think the thing that concerned us as investigators was how a culture had existed where people could actually attend the party knowing that a death was going to occur, whether it was by murder or by suicide, and how people thought that it was okay to attend a party knowing that someone was going to die. Tragically for Joe, Anu began to carry out her plan. Following the meal, and after the guests had left, Joe was given a sedative-laced cup of coffee that rendered him helpless. What we learned was that Joe Chintwe was in fact drugged that night. He was given Rohypnol, that uh, heroin was prepared and put into a syringe, and that night Anu Singh did in fact attempt to kill Joe. My recollection of the evidence was that the heroin was so concentrated in the syringe that it's congealed and that she wasn't able to inject him, that it was a failed attempt. Jo Chinque woke the next morning with little more than a severe hangover, an effect of the rohypnol he'd been unwittingly drugged with. The previous evening, Jo and Anu had been surrounded by friends at a dinner party and all of the guests were well aware of this abhorrent plan. So why did no one intervene? It's a startling feature of this case that it took place when many of the close associates of Anu Singh were themselves law students at the Australian National University. They weren't junior law students, they were quite advanced in their law studies. Here are these law students involved with drug abuse, involved with a whole series of totally irresponsible activities. It is a very disturbing aspect to this case to recognise that you could have a group of people who are very clearly knowledgeable about the law to have colluded in such a way. You don't see murder very often occurring among the more privileged young people of the world. You see killings occurring among the dispossessed and disorganized and dim and distressed. And yeah, this was different. One of the biggest questions that you're left with at the end of all this is just why did nobody stop this? Why did so many people know what was about to happen and not do anything? Anu's alleged attempt to kill Joe with the full knowledge of the party guests had failed. Incredibly, this didn't shake Anu Singh back to reality. Instead, she prepared for a second dinner party that Friday night, where once again, Joe Chinque was drugged and then injected with not one, but two massive doses of heroin. Again, no one tried to stop her. After Anu had administered um, what she thought was a lethal dose of heroin on the Friday night, Joe was still alive on the Saturday in bed, tossing and turning, again on the Sunday, still alive. Um, clearly, she hadn't achieved what she was hoping to. Joe was desperately clinging on to life, despite the massive heroin overdose he'd been given. As Anu witnessed his life slowly ebbing away, she finally reached for the phone. But the call wasn't to the emergency services. On the 26th of October, Anu Singh calls a friend in panic. She, she's telling the friend over the phone that there's been an overdose. 
that friend says to her, you need to call the ambulance. And Anu says, no, no, I can't. And the friend comes back at her and says, you're a selfish bitch. You can't take someone's life. Um, she tries to convince Anu to call the ambulance. She says, if you do, you're going to have a angry boyfriend on your hands. If you don't, you're going to have a murder charge. And it was that phone call that prompted Anu Singh to finally call the ambulance. When the triple zero call was played to court, I think one of the first things that Anu Singh says, fairly calmly, she indicates to the operator, I'd like to report a potential overdose. Yeah, can I get um, an ambulance, please? What? Well, it's not, um, he's, um, uh, vomiting everywhere. I have, a, I have a person potentially overdosed on heroin. Potentially yeah. overdosed. Well, he's not, he's, okay. he's um, vomiting everywhere, but stuff. Right? The operator questions her potential overdose. Um, can you tell us what you mean? And then this wild swaying begins of her being dishonest. She gives the wrong address. She gives the wrong name. She, she calls herself Olivia. So she's actually impeding emergency services attempts to, to get help to this man that she supposedly loves. She's screaming hysterically one second. She is talking calmly the next. Can you please tell me that about that? That's the most not good if he's vomiting blood. She was swaying dramatically between expressing her love from Joe and then refusing to answer the questions. Her unusual behaviour continued when the emergency services arrived. It was a duplex building, so we went in the front door and called out, walked upstairs. There was one ambulance officer inside the bedroom and there was a male casualty laying on the floor and he was naked and the ambulance officer was trying to get a line into his lungs. There was a lot of browny liquid fluid coming out of his mouth, um, so they were having trouble getting past all of that to get into his lungs. So it, he was obviously not conscious at the time, and there was no way that we were going to bring him round. The lady in the house was actually quite frantic, and she was pacing around, walking back and forward to the window, to the door, and she approached me a number of times and one of the times she grabbed hold of my forearm and said he had a lot last night and then to let go and walk back over to the window and just kept pacing around the room. Tragically and despite the valiant efforts of emergency services Jo Chinque died that afternoon. The official cause of death was asphyxiation Anu Singh was brought to the police station as officers tried to determine how this fit young man with no history of drug abuse had met his death. I arrived at the police station and when I saw Anu Singh she was dressed in a flimsy white nightie. She was hot and sweaty. I remember her being clingy, sweaty and she grabbed hold of me and held on to me. She sounded upset. She was asking what happened to Joe and these sort of questions. During this period, she still seemed um, restless. As the interview progressed and police learnt more about the twisted plan Anu had hatched, more and more questions began to be raised about her story. Talking to Anu about uh, the suicide pact that was to occur, the question was often raised why she didn't continue through the suicide herself. Why was it only Joe? And that question remains today. And she never really answered that question. Um, there was no real answer to it at all. There didn't appear to me anyway to be any sorrow in her voice. She was at points sobbing, but at no stage do I remember having to give her tissues or anything to wipe tears away. Anu Singh's claim to the emergency services that Joe had died as a result of an overdose was quickly ruled out. She was charged with his murder that very same day. As detectives continued their investigation, an unexpected twist in the bizarre series of events emerged. 
police began to realize that someone else could have been involved in the death of Zhou Chengkui. Police investigating the death of Zhou Chingkui were questioning his girlfriend, Anu Singh. Zhou died with a huge dose of heroin found in his bloodstream, despite him having no history of drug abuse. Police were beginning to realize that Singh wasn't telling them the full story, but they also discovered that her friend, Madhavi Rao, was implicated in the lead-up to Zhou's death. It's been suggested that Anu's friends just didn't do enough to do something to stop her crazy plans. Uh, I formed the view that Anu had no friends, not in the, not in the real sense. She, she had people she knew from university, people she'd run into. Uh, Madhavi Rao uh, was her friend in some respects, but Madhavi Rao was just a shadow. Uh, Madhavi Rao trialled around after her. She was in awe of Anu Singh. Uh, and she, too, uh, just was swept up in the madness of what she was saying and what she was doing and planning. We were aware that she was a very good friend of Anu Singh's at that time and had, had involvement in the preparation of the crime. I had been to the library with Anu Singh, had looked up how to inject heroin with other people. She'd been involved with uh, purchasing the Rohypnol and also her main involvement was uh, preparing the parties because Anu Singh at that stage really hadn't got people to come to the party. It was left to Madhavi Rao. She was the main uh, person who got the party goers together, so to speak. Following the police investigation, it was determined that there was sufficient evidence to charge both Anu Singh and Madhavi Rao with murder. They initially stood trial together in October 1998, but after four weeks, Due to a legal technicality, the joint trial was abandoned. Now each woman would face a separate trial. Both exercised their right to trial by judge only. In Canberra, it was the right of an accused to opt for a judge only trial. Anu Singh's personality, in some respects, uh, was behind the decision uh, to elect for judge alone trial. I thought it would be very difficult to call her to give evidence in her own defence if that became necessary. She was not someone I thought a jury would find very attractive. Anu Singh chose not to give evidence in her trial, meaning the court would not hear her version of events. I never had a full proof of evidence from her. I had instructions in relation to aspects of the case that I particularly needed because I needed to cross-examine witnesses and put positive propositions to them. Uh, but at no stage, in my recollection is, did I have a comprehensive from start to end narrative from Anu Singh herself. Anu Singh's mental health at the time of Joe's death dominated the trial. To what extent did it play a part in the tragic events of the 26th of October, 1997? The Crown case against Anu Singh was that her acts were deliberate acts of murder. They were premeditated, they were cold-blooded, uh, and that she had made a um, long and detailed plan with a view to bringing about the death of her partner. But when it came to the motive, the motive was a bit thin on the ground. Uh, the most they could point to in large measure was that Anu thought in some way she had been made ill uh, by some advice that Joe had given her to take Ipecac syrup. And when you started analysing the alleged motive, it fed completely and, and utterly into the notion that she was mentally unwell. She had the wherewithal to procure the heroin. She had the wherewithal to procure the Rohypnol. She had the wherewithal to plan not one, but two dinner parties. So looking at, at that whole assemblage, she knew that doing what she did would result in death. There was, in my view, no doubt that this woman had a significant mental disorder, which had been troubling her on and off for a number of years. This is why they went for diminished responsibility, not for insanity. I mean, her responsibility was diminished by the depression. It wasn't removed by the depression. Yes, this woman planned uh, and carried out a killing. Uh, yes, uh, this woman uh, told other people that she was going to kill this man. So there was very clearly a knowledge of what she was doing. The diminished responsibility simply says uh, that the nature of this disorder was one which affected her judgment and affected other aspects of her mental function. 
the judge accepted the defence had established that at all relevant times uh, Anu was suffering from an abnormality of mind. He found that she was suffering from a borderline personality disorder of a uh, at least moderate, if not a greater uh, extent, that she was suffering from depression, that she had an eating disorder, uh, and all of those things meant, uh, in his judgment, that her responsibility for the acts were very substantially diminished. As well as trying to establish Anu Singh's mental state at the time of the killing, the court also faced another question. Just how was this tragedy allowed to happen in the first place? There was a parade of uh, law students from the Australian National University that came through the witness box telling how they had been invited to the party, how that it was uh, not a secret, that it in fact was very open that a crime would be committed. These people were questioned time and time again, why didn't you do anything about this? And I don't know that anybody ever got a satisfactory answer from any of those witnesses as to why on earth didn't anyone do anything to stop them? Anu Singh appeared to be so open about what her intentions were that it is mind-boggling that it was ever allowed to happen. The people we interviewed that were at the dinner party, majority of them seemed very distant to their emotional attachment to the fact that there was going to be a murder or that there was going to be a death. Nowhere during that whole investigation, except for the chinkways, were there any tears shed. So of all the people we interviewed, of all the people we spoke to who had close affinity to this whole crime, my memory is that not one tear was shed by these people for Joe. Despite numerous witnesses who gave evidence at the trial, the spotlight was never far from the accused. One of the strongest pieces of evidence that sticks in my mind is that Anu had told people that um, it's, it wouldn't be hard to convince someone that you're crazy, that she had such a good knowledge of psychiatry, that she had a good knowledge of, of the law, and that if she had wanted to, it wouldn't be hard to convince somebody that she was insane. We were so close to Anu Singh sitting there when confronting evidence was heard, she would put her head in her hand, she would, you could see her shoulders shaking, and then you would see her look around and look at you as if to say, are you watching me? Can you see me crying? On the 23rd of April, 1999, Anu Singh was found guilty of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Justice Crispin delivered a sentence of 10 years with a non-parole period of four years. Given the time that she had spent behind bars during the trial, she would serve just 18 months. To the family and friends of Joe Chinque, it was a devastating outcome. I start to cry, I want to kill her. I really want to kill her. The moment that the verdict came down, there was an eruption. There was an eruption and it was Maria Cinque and it was Nino Cinque who rarely spoke. Just spontaneous explosion of hatred aimed at Anu Singh. I know sometimes uh, from someone who's not used to this, they say, well, you know, she planned it. She talked about it. Clearly, uh, this is an intentional act. Yes, it is. Uh, clearly, there's no excuse for that. But the law says, and I think rightly, that if you're significantly mentally disordered, such that if you hadn't been mentally disordered, you almost certainly wouldn't have committed those acts, uh, then that does diminish your responsibility. Someone who has sat there and premeditated, planned a party, how anyone could look at those set of circumstances and judge that to be diminished responsibility is beyond me. I'm not a judge, I'm not a lawyer, but to me that was premeditated. Is she sick in the head? Absolutely she's sick in the head, but she knew exactly what she was doing and given she knew what she was doing she should pay the price. When we heard the sentence we thought it was, was a joke. Ten years and the uh, probation, four years, uh, are you joking? You get for a dog, you get there long. 
He's a man. He was 26 years old. And he, he would live another 60 years for sure. And you give four years to her. What's the, what kind of... Uh, we scream and scream and we couldn't believe it. And the police next to us there, he said, that's the way it is. What the evidence pointed to us as police was a contrived crime. She'd moved, studying it, understanding it, having parties, going and having uh, heroin shots herself to see what the reaction would be and how to deliver heroin, trying it on uh, Joe once, then trying it again. I think the normal public would ask themselves how could a person walk away with just 18 months real time from that crime and then continue their life while someone had lost theirs and a family had lost their son. Following the completion of Anu Singh's trial, it was the turn of her friend and alleged accomplice, Madhavi Rao, to face justice. She was represented by uh, Lex Lazary QC, and Lex raised uh, technical legal arguments why Madhavi could not be guilty uh, as an accessory or someone involved in Anu Singh's uh, crime, and that was successful, uh, and she was acquitted. The judge's explanation was that there was nothing that could actually pinpoint Madhavi Rao in the room when Anu gave Joe the fatal injection that killed him at that time. I think people were astounded, and people still are astounded. I don't know if there's more unanswered questions in relation to the trial of Madhavi Rao than there is Anu Singh. At least Anu Singh got found guilty with this other person where evidence had been produced that she had been with Anu Singh, that Marty V had been helping her find material at the library, had personally bought the row hypnol, who had went round and had spoken to people about going to the party, how that person could walk away. And I think this is part of the enigma of all of this. How, how does Anu Singh get found guilty, no matter what the sentence was? And how did this other person or free. That question is just another reason why Joe's family and friends remain so frustrated with the justice system in Australia and why today they still struggle to deal with their loss. The injustice that is associated to his death again overlays all this. The fact that the Chinque family feel absolutely betrayed by the justice system in Australia. Uh, the fact that there has been really nothing close to what they would call um, adequate justice for what she did. With Maria, what a lot of people don't realise is that she lost a child at the hands of someone she invited into her own home and embraced as a potentially a daughter-in-law. She cooked for this woman, you know, an, an Italian woman, the, 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 the way they express love is through cooking. And she sat at that very table where they still sit down every day and have their lunch, you know, and served her a meal. You know, the, the woman who was responsible for killing her son in the most brutal of fashions. He took two and a half days to die. He was tortured. When uh, October comes, a terrible time. His birthday is worse. Nobody rings you. Either they remember or not, we don't know. You don't feel like go out. Even if you see something funny, you, do, you start laughing, you stop. Because you think, no, I, I should not enjoy myself. I've got no right to enjoy myself. Because you think, why should I? I've got no right. He's not here anymore. If anyone thinks I mildly, even mildly understand what she went through, think again. I would ask every mother out there to think about their firstborn son being killed by their girlfriend, a woman you invited into your own home, and taking two days to do it. No one can understand what she's been through. No one. I don't care what anybody says. No one can understand it. You have to go through things like that to understand. People tell you, oh, understand, understand. No, you don't understand until you go through. You don't know how bad it is losing a child. He was a person. He was my son, and he lived 26 and a half years. 
and he's not here anymore. 